Welcome everyone to our second APS division of gravitational physics, the graph webinar of this semester. This is our ninth DGRAPH uh, seminar uh, webinar. All of these seminars are recorded. We encourage you, you to go to our web page and check the other ones that had happened in the past. The idea of these seminars is to help us to learn new subjects and topics in physics, in gravitational physics, but it's also a, a venue to provide junior researchers with the opportunity to introduce themselves to our community. And that's why we pair a senior person with a junior person in this series. So it's, it's a very interesting form. Today, we have the pleasure to have Samuel Grala and Hong Ji Wei from the University of Arizona talking about Bob in a black hole or on the coherency from horizons. So the, as I said, there will be two parts of this talk. First, uh, Sam will speak and then he has to leave. So there will be a brief pause for you to ask questions and then Hong Ji will uh, present and there will also be more time for general questions. Um, here I want to emphasize Hong Ji is an undergrad. Uh, so this is this is very exciting. So someone Hong Ji, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Oh, there it is. Oh, and then let's take it away. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this work. We are polishing the paper and it'll be on the archive very shortly. And I'll tell you about it today, along with Hong Ji, who is an undergraduate student, and I'll introduce him a little more when it's his turn to talk. I've got on this slide a list of some big questions that I think every theoretical physicist uh, probably at least a little bit interested in. How does the classical world emerge from quantum mechanics? Is information preserved? You know, black hole evaporation and all that. Are there fundamental limits on maintaining quantum coherence? And it's not every day that a new idea comes out that really touches on two or maybe all three. So I was really excited when last year, this paper appeared from Danielson, Satisthandran, and Wald on decoherence from horizons. And the thing I love about this story is that you can tell it at the PBS special level, and you can tell it at the Danielson, Satisthandran, Wald level, and the two arguments agree. The calculations support the incredibly simple story. So I'm going to start with the really simple story, and, and it goes as follows. Alice is an experimentalist. She's trying to build a quantum computer. So she makes quantum superpositions that, of course, she wants to keep coherent so her quantum computer works. Bob, on the other hand, has some encrypted secrets, and he does not want Alice's quantum computer to work. But if he goes into her lab and just bashes the whole thing, he knows he'll get caught. So Bob comes up with a much sneakier way to stop Alice's quantum computer. He goes outside of her lab and he measures the gravitational field from the quantum superpositions in the quantum computer. Now, why does this work? Well, Alice is excellent at isolating her experiment from the external world. That's what she does for a living but she can't screen gravity. She can't keep gravity out. So when there's a particle in a spatial superposition, say, in her apparatus, part of it, the one branch of that superposition is closer to Bob and has a slightly stronger gravitational field. The other branch is further from Bob and has a slightly weaker gravitational field. So if Bob measures the gravitational field, he can measure Alice's state. He can find out if the particle went right or left, closer or further. And by simple Copenhagen type interpretation, if he measures the state, he collapses her state. He, he really screws up her quantum superposition. In the fancier modern language, you would say that Alice's state has decohered. She needs to trace over these degrees of freedom she doesn't control, and her quantum computer won't work. So Bob is going to put this plan into action, but he's still worried about getting caught because they'll see him outside doing his experiment. So what Bob decides to do is ingenious. He makes a black hole and he jumps into the black hole. Why is this good? Well, first of all, they can't know he did it, right? He's in a black hole. They can't find out what's going on in there. On the other hand, he can still see Alice's gravitational field. The gravitational field perfectly well goes in. He can perfectly well do his measurement and he can perfectly well screw up Alice's quantum computer. So he's about to actually do this when he realizes, wait a minute, he doesn't actually have to jump in at all because no one can know if he's in there or not. Merely the fact that someone like him could have been inside the black hole 
is telling you that Alice's state must decohere because somebody inside the black hole could have made a measurement that must decohere her state, but correspondingly, nothing anyone does in the black hole can affect her state. It means her state must actually decohere itself. So this is a very simple argument based on general principles of quantum mechanics and causality, nothing else, that tells you that any quantum superposition near a black hole must decohere all by itself. The black hole itself must somehow decohere the quantum superposition. So that's the PBS special level of the story. And what Danielson, Satish Chandran, and Wald did was, well, they came up with this whole idea and then they did the calculation. And so what DSW found is that the coherence of Alice's state decreases exponentially. The longer she tries to keep her superposition open, the more decoherent her state is. There's nothing she can do. So capital T in this whole talk is gonna be the time she keeps the superposition open. There's gonna be little t, which is the time evolution, but big T is always the time she keeps her superposition open and the coherence decreases exponentially with the rate. And they calculated the rate up to an unknown prefactor in a few different cases. And although I'm not gonna get into the interpretation in terms of soft gravitons and memory, just to pique your interest, I'll say there's some relationship there and uh, it connects it to some other fields of physics that make it even more interesting. But for now, I wanna set up what needs to be done next after this amazing first analysis. Well, the contexts they consider don't allow you to tune the temperature of the black hole. It's surface gravity. So it's, it's hard to ask questions about what the temperature, what role it's playing in this whole thing. You can't take an extrema limit. You can't go near the horizon for black holes in their calculation. And so it's hard to answer big questions like comparing it to phenomena with ordinary black bodies. So there's a lot of big questions I would love to answer about the meaning and implications of this effect, but I think the first step is just to calculate. And so what we've done, and this will appear very shortly, is we've generalized their calculation to an arbitrary killing observer outside a bifurcate killing horizon. And we've evaluated the formula receipt we derived for observers on the symmetry axis of a curved black hole, which is a context where you can do extremal limits and things like that. So it's very nice in that it's general, it's exact. We don't have the unknown prefactor, we just have the rate. We've got extremal and near horizon limits and we do a Klein-Gordon analog, which is quite illuminating. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have the gravitational calculation done quite yet, so I won't be able to tell you about that today. Everything today will be Klein-Gordon and e &M analog. Okay, so in just a few minutes, what I want to do is set up Hanji's talk. I want to um, tell you the lay of the land, and you'll see all this again in his talk. So the setup is there's a bifurcate killing horizon, and there's someone outside, Alice, who makes an initial state, which is in a superposition of a particle that will go left and a particle that will go right. So you can do this in practice by, amazingly, people can do this. You can embed a spin degree of freedom in some kind of mesoscopic particle so that you can put the whole big particle, like a little hunk of diamond, you can put that through a stern gerlach apparatus and split it into left and right. Uh, so the initial state is a tensor product state between the initial, you know, nano diamond sitting there without being yet split and the state of the quantum field, which in a sense we'll define, we're gonna take to be the unruh state. And Alice's laboratory states, the capital size are orthogonal. And what happens is the field responds differently to the evolution, the gravitational field. In this case, we're gonna do E and M and Klein-Gordon. Uh, the field state psi left little psi now is going to be a little different from the field state psi right. And so if those, when they evolve, if those states become orthogonal, so if the field states associated with the left and right branches of the superposition have no overlap, then Alice's state has totally decohered, right? In the Copenhagen point of view, Bob in the black hole could make a measurement of this state and, and collapse Alice's wave function into capital psi left or capital psi right. Another way of saying this is the field states little psi left and little psi right are distinguishable. Or finally, you could just say, well, now Alice has to trace over those degrees of freedom and you do that trace. And because it's not a tensor product, you find it's decohered. So our goal, the whole rest of the talk is to calculate the overlap psi left psi right of the response of the electromagnetic field 
to Alice's quantum superposition. There's gonna be four parts and Hongji is gonna go through each in turn. We're gonna review quantum fields in curved space time, but we need a semi-classical source and we have to have one that is persistent. There are Coulomb fields at the beginning and the end, so that makes it a little different. Then we have to derive this formula for the overlap in terms of something called the expected number of entangling particles. This is a notion that DSW introduced and we're gonna flesh out and, and do things in a slightly different way, but it's the same idea. And then we need to evaluate this expected number of entangling particles. That's step three, and we'll get this formula uh, you see below in terms of the surface gravity kappa of the horizon, capital T, the superposition, the time the superposition is open, and the biggest new ingredient in what we've done is this capital C, which we call the decohering flux. This is the thing you calculate uh, about Alice's experiment and the space time it's in to find out how much information is going in the horizon for Bob to get. And that's the interpretation. And the math is it just shows up in the rate. I'll just flash up some results. Uh, Hongji is going to take you through all of these, but we have really nice formulas. So if you want to know the rate of decoherence in your favorite space time with a killing horizon, you can evaluate these integrals. And one very interesting thing is this yellow line is going to zero in the extremal limit. And, and Hongji is going to show you how that uh, really foiled Bob's plans. If he makes a black hole, he better not create an extremal black hole or his, his goal of disrupting Alice's state is actually not going to work. And that's related to something called the black hole Meissner effect, which screens the witch path information from the black hole. But that's a teaser. And what I'd like to do is pause now for questions before I run off and teach and just see if people have questions about the setup mainly or the strategy uh, so we can get on the same page better for Hongji to take you through this calculation. Thank you, Sam. Let me see if so on. So people can raise their hand, virtual hands, or in, unmute themselves if there are some questions. Uh, yes, Ivan. Oh, okay, just one. So I guess Ivan. Okay. Ivan mm. Agujo, you can you can. Yes. Uh, hi, Sam. Yes. Uh, uh, nice, nice introduction. Very interesting. Um, so um, uh, my question is the following. Um, uh, in this slide, when you decompose the initial state uh, uh, of the matter in this left and right, you could have decomposed it in many different ways, right? In infinitely many different ways. Uh, it's a pure state, it's a state in the Hilbert space itself, and you have decided to write it in this specific manner. I imagine because, you know, one assumes that um, 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 uh, states with well-defined position are like pointer states uh, for this uh, system, you know, is the states in which the system decohere. Uh, 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 is that the right assumption or is there any other... Uh, assumption behind this decomposition? Well, well, let me state one assumption, which I didn't state explicitly, is that each state is going to be treated semi-classically from the perspective of quantum fields and curved space time. So the left state should be a semi-classical state whose charge density can be put into the field equations for the field. Uh, and same for the right state. And then we consider a superposition of those two states. So the main property we want, and this is just, this is the identical setup to DSW, by the way. The, the main property we want is that this left and right are going to evolve into a spatial superposition. And that's one particular state that this argument shows decoheres, but the idea is this is a generic thing. You know, you could pretty much anything you did with a quantum state, there ought to be a similar argument showing that it decoheres. Hongji will have a list of assumptions that make a little more precise what we mean by semi-classical, but it's just squiggles. You know, it's just, the, these are, you know, the quantum effects uh, should only be relevant, these states should only be relevant for Alice's lab. The quantum nature shouldn't matter for the response of the electromagnetic field to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Yeah, my question was related. Um, okay. But just if Sam, you could collaborate a tiny bit. Like, suppose the quantum computer was using spin states rather than placing something in different locations. So then there would be different magnetic dipole fields or something. And is there a generalization? Is there a reason to believe that, you know, no matter what 
operating physics the computer uses, it can't work because everything couples enough to gravity that it will always, some version of this argument will always work. Is there a general argument like that? I mean, that's that's my take on it in a word. I think the general argument is more or less the PBS special I gave at the beginning. Like there's just, you can't stop gravity from getting out. A sufficiently clever Bob can measure some information, but I don't have more than that. Yeah, I guess that just relies on the fact that any quantum, any states that Alice can distinguish in her lab would produce different gravitational, long range gravitational fields yep. or electromagnetic fields. Thanks. Well, any other question? You take this chair. Okay. Anyone has a okay. last question? Not. Then we can move on to the second part of the talk. So Hong, take it away. Thank you, Sam. Okay, here's Hong Ji. Um, I just want to say briefly who he is. Hong Ji is an undergraduate student. He's applying to grad school. This is actually his second paper. Uh, his first paper is on a totally different topic. It's on BMS at all five infinities and matching them together. Um, so I'm really happy to have Hong Ji here while I have him, and he could be yours next year. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and uh, here is the outline of my talk, which in Professor Grala's talk, he has already mentioned that this is the strategy page, which I'll treat those four problems separately. Firstly, I'd like you got into this treating quantum field in curved space time with a semi-classical source, which is we'll need to do deal with those Coulomb field that is persisting throughout the exper experiment. As a review, a free curve space-time QFT, we assume the space-time to be globally hyperbolic, so there are things like Cauchy surface of the space-time. So you can define those things such as Klein-Gordon product, and furthermore, the product is Cauchy surface independent. One can obtain a complete set of mode, so you can define your Fox space, and those modes are orthonormal with respect to the product for a real solution can always separate them into a positive frequency and a negative frequency parts, which is the sum of those modes, where positive frequency is the modes and the negative frequency are the complex conjugation of modes. So now that the source exists, how to give a quantized theory? Well, we would intentionally move into the Heisenberg picture, which is how everybody else does it, where the Heisenberg picture operator satisfies the source equations. So think of a classical solution to this source equation that can be always written as an inhomogeneous solution, which is a classical solution that satisfies the inhomogeneous equation, which is source. And some degree of freedom, which is the homogeneous part. So now that we want to quantize the theory, we promote the homogeneous part into some quantum fields, allow some quantum fluctuations, basically expand them in terms of modes, and uh, give those prescriptions of creation and annihilation operators, and then you choose a vacuum. So what this equation is saying is basically some fl quantum fluctuation around some background field, which is the Coulomb field. It is the classical solution we stick in here. However, the notion of Coulomb field or radiation field doesn't come in unless we impose some conditions on space-time having some asymptotic regions, such as future infinity, which is corresponding this late time, or past infinity, which is corresponding the early time. So we can impose those no incoming radiation, and you'll get a unique solution to the classical equation, which we call the retarded solution. And at early time, because there's no incoming radiation, we would interpret the retarded solution as Coulomb field. Analogously, the advanced solution is interpreted as this, well, Coulomb field at late time. So given the Coulomb field and at late time and early time, we can define those, we can write the field operators in terms of those Coulomb field, which is retarded solution, advanced solution. And the first expression, which is the phi equal, this A's and A daggers, they define the in-state where we specify the early time Coulomb field, that means the in-state is considered no radiation at er early time. Analogously, those out-states defined by those B operators 
are considered no radiation later. So if the source exists persistently, or, or even the source exists at some point, the out state would have the in state will have particles, those out particles, which means that if you take the in state in the Schrodinger picture and it evolves into something, it will evolve into some state that has particles. And those particles numbers are given by those alpha, which are the expansion coefficients of the retarded minus advanced. Recall that retarded advanced are two inhomogeneous solutions. They must differ by only a radiation field, which is a homogeneous solution, source free solution. So now to compute the total particle number, which is the alpha squared summed, there's a nice formula that involves the inner product and this positive frequency extraction map K. This, this formula is the one that we are going to use in our computation. Now we have dealt with the Coulomb field. We're going to move, move to the next part, which is to deal with Okay, now we have a superposition analysis experiment. We want to define the expected number of entangling photon and furthermore to verify this equality, which is the so defined coherence is equal to some exponential of the entangling photon number. So before flashing into that, I would go on and give a detailed list. Of what are the assumptions we are having in this whole experiment? We will do everything in this section in Schrodinger picture because we think it's more natural to think of the fields or, or, the, or the states evolved and the fields operators evolving. The Alice's experimental states are those left and right states. They'll kind of follow different trajectories where they, they are orthogonal at all time. Those states are semi-classical in density, which those rows are thought of as the expectation value of the row operator. And those densities are source for the QFT that we're talking about in this case, Klein-Gordon. And those rows agree at early time because Alice has her particles not in the superposition state spatially. And when Alice trying to open the spatial superposition, the row will disagree and row will agree at late time again because Alice closed it. Therefore, at early time, the Coulomb field will agree. Similar story to late time. Recall that the Coulomb field at early time is the retarded solution. So the right and left retarded solution to the Klein-Gordon equation with the sources at early time would agree. Analogously, the advanced solution will agree at late time. The second assumption is we want to define those quantum fields, state of the quantum field. And we would assume that the quantum field undergoes this unitary evolution or psi naught is the in vacuum state. However, well, the in vacuum state needs to define with the Coulomb field prescribed. So we nevertheless need to use those notions of evolving field operators. There is no ambiguity in the definition of in vacuum states since the retarded solution, which are the vacuum for left and right states agree. Therefore, we got this in vacuum states are all annihilated by this evolving field operator, which agrees at early, um, early time. However, evolving field operators disagree. The Schrodinger picture operator agrees. That's one advantage in working in this Schrodinger picture. So peop people will be confused that the evolving field operators having two, there are two evolving field operators and there are two unitary evolutions for left and right field states, but the combination that appears in the right-hand side would always agree for, for left and right states. So this page has already been mentioned, but I'm just gonna mention again, or in, initially the state is in the in vacuum state we defined earlier, and the experimental state is in the superposition between left and right that have the same expectation of current density. And during the evolution, Left state, the left state would have a different response to the right states of the electromag uh, electromagnetism or Klein-Gordon. We would assume that those Klein-Gordon or electromagnetism or any quantum fields that couple to the states doesn't back react. So Alice can follow the protocol in her experiment to open and close the superposition. And the later equation 
appears at all time t. Now at late time, when the experiment is done, you will have a difference between the left field state and the right field state, which means that the left and right field states responds differently to the different path that LS has taken. Therefore, if the left and right field states are nearly the same or agree up to a phase at late time, we call this coherence maintained. They can still have a phase difference. Um, at late time, if, the, if they are evolved to be completely orthogonal, we call this coherence destroyed. So this late time inner product between left and right field state is a key quantity. And to compute this key quantity, we, know, we need to use the evolution of the state from the initially, which is those unitary evolution operator. After a simple plug-in, we will get this late time state equal to this vacuum expectation of the D operator, where D is just the late time difference of the unitary evolution. To compute the D, which is the late time difference of the unitary evolution, we would need to compute the difference in the evolving field operator, which is um, which is differing by only a classical part, which is this difference right and minus left retarded part. And after some computation, we get the late time difference to be equal to the difference of the retarded at late time. So if you look at the figure in the right, at early time, the retarded solutions agree because the Fulham field agree. At late time, this retard the difference of retarded becomes sourceless because the source of the late time agree. So it becomes purely a radiation field. That field is we call entangling radiation. If you want to obtain just a pure radiation throughout the process, we subtract the advanced field and obtain this delta phi. That kind of is a whole, just a pure radiation field throughout the process. It's kind of propagating those late time fields, which is this retarded minus advanced uh, right minus left. We call this entangling radiation field. So this D operator at late time would shift the left state, left field operator to the right field operator, which is equal to the left field operator plus the entangling radiation. Given that it's the displacement operator, you can write it in terms of mode expansions and get those exponentials of those, um, the modes difference for delta, uh, modes of delta phi. As a consequence of displacement operator, it being a displacement operator, the vacuum expectation value will be the exponential of the sum of the mode expansion coefficient. Recall that is the definition of the sum of some mode expansion coefficients are photon numbers that is produced, but now it is the sum of right minus left. Therefore, we call, we call it an entangling photon because that is photon which is, that's a difference of the field produced by the difference of source between right and left. And we can analogously use this inner product representation of this delta phi field, which is the radiation field. Consequently, we have shown that at late time, the coherence kind of becomes this exponential of minus the photon entangling photon number, where it is the photon number in this entangling field delta phi. After justifying that formula, we would cal we would calculate some we would calculate this photon number for some pre specific prescriptions of Alice, which is she hold the particle for the superposition spatial superposition for a long time in an arbitrary killing horizon space time, and we'll show the following equation appears. Here is the setup of the experiment. And I'm gonna give a small review on space-time with killing horizon. For example, the past horizon is parameterized by the U and XA coordinate where the U is the affine time, which is the affine parameter of the geodesic generator of the horizon. And XA is just some angular coordinate on the horizon or some, or some two coordinate on the horizon like X and Y in, in Riddler. And the space-time is fully in four regions. We're interested, in the we're interested only in the interior region, 
which is where the experiment is done. So experiment has this initial non-separated source and then put it in the super, spatial superposition, holding for a long time T and then close it. Experiment state, the experimental source is assumed to be on any killing orbit, which is on the symmetric, which is on the symmetry orbit in the space time. And this killing orbit on the horizon gives you the parameter for the killing orbit on the horizon is this killing time little u. It only exists in the experiments, uh, in the exterior patch, in the interior patch is a different parameter, which is also u, it's related to the big u in a different way. And the exterior patch on the past horizon, this affine time big u is related to the killing time little u in this formula, where kappa is a surface gravity and it is a constant throughout the region. And also there are other, other structures like null infinities exist. Going to the computation, our goal is to compute the number of entangling photon, which is this number of photon in the entangling field where the entangling field is the retarded minus advanced right minus left. It's shown in the right state, right, right, right figures. Recall that this number of photon can be given by its inner product of some positive frequency parts of this pure radiation field where it's sourceless. So we can choose any Cauchy surface to do this computation. In principle, people would do the computation in future horizon and future null infinity, which is the very late time of the Cauchy surface, limits to. But unruh state is defined on past horizon. So we would move to the past horizon, push this Cauchy surface in the early time, and to compute quantities in the past horizon and past null infinity, where in our talk, we'll just focus on past horizon. Well, entangling field, which is the retarded minus advanced, right minus left on the past horizon, it's given by the difference in the advanced solution. Therefore, we can use the, use the uh, inner product formula and the positive frequency modes on the past horizon, which is e to the minus i omega big U, to give an expression of this number of expected photon, uh, expected particles on the contribution from past horizon. And because we need to understand this experiment and this experiment is done on a killing orbit, we better use the killing time on the past horizon. And indeed, after deriving this formula, we get the formula, we, we get this number of expected photon on the past horizon to be some integral of some frequency, with res which is the Fourier transformation of the field on the past horizon with respect to this killing time. And the field will look like this. When Alice doesn't have her super superposition spatially, the field will be zero. There's no difference in the initial field. When Alice slowly holds her particle apart, the field strength on the past horizon will undergo some transition. There might be some skulls, some little phot some photons emitted, but not as much. And it gradually plateaus to be on this to be on this value, which is given by the static solution, where in this case we call a Coulomb field, of the difference, which is of this effective either dipole or the difference of the superposition. And we call the static period will plateau for a very, very long time where we name it as the capital T. We call this holding time. And this profile is exaggerated, it's very wide. And then it follows some short transition time and denoted by this squiggle T and the field gets back to zero again. So the, this plot is kind of exaggerated. What this plot should look like is something like above where we kind of centered it's like a double side, it's like a double bump, double side, have a side function. So this gives us a natural way to break down the evaluation of this expected number into a Fourier, into this integral of some frequencies where frequencies correspond to some time scales. So we break it down into some intermediate frequencies, which gives rise to some intermediate time scales. 
And the first part is from zero frequency, which is the long time limit to some intermediate time between the width of this holding and you know, this intermediate time should be really long compared with the transition period. So in that regime, we can approximate this Fourier transformation with respect to the killing time as this Fourier transformation of the double heaviside bump. We approximate the first part of the integral in non-extremal case by some approximating some cotange, and we got this linear divergence scaling with the holding time t. And in the extremal case, the kappa is really small, so cotange will become approximately one. Therefore, it will linear, it will logarithmically divergent with respect to the holding time t, where t is the holding killing time. And the delta phi white hat, which is the Coulomb field, look at the integral form, the Coulomb field kind of factor out and give us this factor C, where we naturally define as this decohering flux, which is just the Coulomb field of this superposition, whether in ENM is a dipole, in Klein Gordon is a superposition of the different charge different Klein-Gordon monopole moment it will be a Coulomb field, and we can just evaluate this integral on the horizon, it will get the C. And the second part of integral, we will not get too much into it, but no big T, no, no wide, no holding time dependency is present in the second integral. As a reveal, um, this is the result so far we have gotten to. We have calculated the entangling photon numbers and give a definition to it where this entangling photons will obtain a scale with respect to the holding killing time. And the factor in front is something we define as the cohering flux, which is some integral of some Coulomb field of the superposition, the Coulomb field of difference on the horizon. And we derived it for Klein-Gordon. We did not derive it for ENM. It's an, pretty analogous. Some more subtleties like gauge fixing will go in there, but we can see from the formula that it's completely manifestly gauge independent. And furthermore, the coherence will decay exponentially with respect to the killing holding time t in the non-extremal limit, and it will decay like it will decay like a power law with respect to killing uh, killing time if it is in non-extremal case if it is in extremal case. So now we're in the position to evaluate this this decohering flux or curve, which is just integrating some Coulomb field, right? Um, so in Klein-Gordon, we consider a superposition of different Klein-Gordon monopole moments. As I said, there's Alice can just outer the monopole moment, whatever she wants. She can make it into a superposition of two different Klein-Gordon monopole. And it is assumed to be at boyer lindquist coordinate R0 on the symmetry axis. And the Coulomb field is already given by Linnet in 1977. We just used them and we obtained this nice formula for decohering flux. And analogous computation happens in Kerr, but now you cannot change the electromagnetic charge. So you can only put it in radial superposition where the proper distance is D, which will give you an effective dipole for electromagnetism. It is also assumed to be on the symmetry axis. It is also be assumed to have this boyer lindquist radius R0, so this separation is really small. At this point, we can evaluate some Coulomb field on the horizon. We use the field tensors from Lotte and Linnet. It's quite complicated, so we'll not show it here. Finally, we got this decohering flux formula on the horizon, which is not very illuminating because it's so long and doesn't see much structure. So we make a plot where the blue line is the Klein-Gordon monopole and the ENM is dipole. This plot is shown for a fixed mass black hole at a fixed radius R0 for a fixed, you know, either Klein-Gordon monopole, entangling monopole or ENM entangling dipole. And you just, this plot is plot, this plot is drawn for holding everything else the same, except for the spin A of the black hole. And, as we saw earlier, as we saw here, as you spin the black hole to extremum, the ENM decohering flux will vanish. A nice interpretation 
for this vanishing of the coherent flux is the Meissner effect. Here, the right side is the plot, which is the difference of the electric field, which is the, the Coulomb electric field, which is the entangling field. And you can see the field lines kind of penetrate through the short shield black hole. And it doesn't penetrate through extreme occur. You see that field line just going and then go around the horizon and go down. Therefore, it comes back to the interpretation, it comes back to the computation where flux is screened. There is no entangling photon into the horizon, so there's no decoherence in the extremal case. Given that we have the formula, we might as well take some limits. There are some interesting limits. Firstly, we did some consistency check, such as if you take a non-rotating large distance, we got this result matching with DCSW 2022, which is the short shield result, their black hole defect decohering quantum superposition paper with some prefactors. Similarly, if you're going, re going really close to the short shield horizon, we'll get this decohering flux look really like, well, uh, or the horizon looks really like a Rindler. So the decohering flux will just go to Rindler that matches with 2023 DSW. We take the extremal limit, but we see that it vanishes with respect to this epsilon defined as some parameter where epsilon goes to zero. We also took near neck limit because your coordinate, your, your spatial coordinate also, so your distance to the horizon also goes to zero. So this near neck limit is non-vanishing. And for neck limit, you just need to take epsilon equals zero for near neck limit. So the decoherent flux also vanishes in neck limit. So as a summary, everything that has happened. We derived a precise formula for decoherence for, from an arbitrary killing horizon. In particular, we gave this decoherence rate, which, is, which scales with this time scale at which superpositions maintain big T. And the C is the decohering flux, where we just need to evaluate some Coulomb fields integrals on the horizon. We also obt we obtain the closed form expression for decoherent flux in Kerr, and we take a bunch of limits and it matches with the results that other people gave in those limits. Remind remind you guys that at an early early on in this talk, the way that we start this talk with is the whole story where there can be a somebody in black hole that can decohere Alice's experiment. So Alice's experiment can decohere, needs to decohere itself. However, the decoherence vanishes in the extremal limit because flux is screened. There is a Meissner effect. No flux can penetrate through the horizon. Therefore, there is no which path information can penetrate through the horizon. Hence, there is no decoherence, which supports the causality understanding of this. Therefore, Bob now is really mad because he cannot mess up Alice's experiment anymore in the extremal black hole. If you want, if Bob wants to create a black hole, that better not be an extreme black hole. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have plenty of time uh, for questions, so please raise your hand and then unmute yourself, please. Uh, okay, so let me I just ask, um, since you did this for a general killing horizon, I assume that your general results hold for Reisner Nordstrom and adding cosmological constants and and all of that, right? Yeah. Um, and presumably an extreme Reisner Nordstrom would also behave like extreme Kerr for the electromagnetic case and not, uh, or did you look at that or, or did you? Uh... We did not look into that yet, but I guess we, you just need to look at the Coulomb field on the extreme Reisner Nordstrom if there is no uh, yeah. going there. I would expect it would also not I would expect here for that, uh, for that case. More questions? Yes, and Andrew Sandmetz, San please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, Hangji. Uh, good job with the presentation. Uh, my question is the 
uh, Meissner effect for the black holes, specifically the uh, you showed a plot where the decoherence was suppressed for high spin for the uh, Klein-Gordon monopole as well as the electromagnetic dipole case. Uh, is this Meissner effect also present for both kinds of charge uh, in uh, so this diagram here, does that affect both kinds of charge? Or do you see the same effect in either case? You mean the you mean the Klein-Gordon or? Yeah, the Klein-Gordon monopole versus the EM dipole ah, we were okay. discussing earlier. Yeah, Klein-Gordon monopole seems like not having this Meissner effect because you still have this non-vanishing rate decohering flux on the, at the extreme limit. So the decoherence is suppressed, but doesn't vanish. But yeah. for the EM dipole, it is not only suppressed, but also actually vanishes. Exactly. So in Klein-Gordon, you'll get this logarithmic or divergence of photon number, which means that the coherence will decay in a power law. And EM will completely vanish in the extremal limit. Thank you. That answers my question. More questions? Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please go um, ahead. So the, the original paper that you're developing from did not mention the decoherence rate as being related to the surface gravity, if I remember correctly. Ah, the decoherence rate. Um, yes. So There was some formula for it, and it wasn't clear that it was related to the surface gravity based yeah. on that formula. With, um, so I'm just wondering, is there, I guess you might've even said this and I just missed it, but is there an intuition for like why it's the surface gravity that's coming in? And also, I guess, let me ask a kind of almost, uh, like why didn't the authors of the previous paper recognize that it was the surface gravity? <laughs> like, is it a hidden thing or is it obvious? It is not obvious how this relates to uh, the surface gravity and the interpretation that black hole is a thermal state. But we did notice that if you look at the formula above where, where this, this, uh, this number of expected photon evaluated in terms of killing time, this is really, if you do the same calculation in Bohr, you will get this cotange factor to be one. And the difference of the one in the Unruh and the Bohr is of kind of integrating this thing in term with some thermal spectrum where the temperature is given by this horizon. Yeah, that might be the connection so far that we have seen, but I don't know that much about further wording to that or interpretation to that surface gravity and temperature and things. Yeah. That answers your question. Yeah, I think so. It's it's um because of so simple in a way, it seems like makes me suspicious that there's a way to anticipate it, you know, with very little calculation at all. Yeah. I I have no more intuition to that problem as well. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you. Um I don't see more questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Sam and Hongji. Uh, this is a very, very interesting work. Uh, let me see, Can do we have the schedule for the next window? So the next one will be in December 7th by Alessandra Papa and Benjamin Stelder. This is going to be our next seminar. And if there are no more questions, we can thank the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you hope to see you in the next session. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you, Hongji.